So um, welcome to the webinar, um, the use of IPM in beekeeping to control parasitic varroa mites uh, with Robin Under Underwood. My name is Jana Hexter, and I work with the Northeastern IPM program. If you do the next slide. Um, uh, live transcription is available um, on, on this webinar, and uh, we are recording it. And the recording will be available in about a week on our website. And everybody who is registered um, will receive a copy of the of the recording at this link. But don't worry about looking at the link because I'll email it to you. All right. And how we're going to manage this is uh, by questions rather than the chat. So if you have a question, um, if you scroll your mouse over your screen, you'll see that black bar that appears. And in the middle of that is something that says Q&A and, and some little rectangles. If you click on there, you can ask a question uh, for Robin. And you can also, uh, there's another checkbox in there that you can ask them anonymously if you'd like to. Um, we're going to have a break in the middle for, for your questions and at the end. And um, try, if you want to put comments in the chat, you can, but please try not to put your um uh, uh, your uh, questions in the chat because it's uh, too difficult for me to keep track of uh, during during the session. Uh, next slide, please. So I'm really delighted to introduce our presenter today, who is Robin Underwood. She received her bachelor's in entomology and applied ecology from the University of Delaware and her PhD in entomology from the University of Manitoba. At Penn State's, um, as Penn State's Extension Educator of Apiculture, she conducts scientific research projects to study beekeeper applied questions and brings the results of the projects to beekeepers through extension products that aim to make beekeeping a more successful venture. And, um, and uh, this, is, this is a product of that, of uh, her, uh, Robin's Underwood. So thank you very much and, and thank you for joining us today, Robin. So the well, next thing I think is uh, we have some questions actually before we begin. Um, if you want to move to the next slide, you should see a poll on your screen. And uh, we just have a few questions that help Robin understand where people are or who is here um, so that uh, she can uh, tailor her speaking to you. So I'll be quiet for a moment uh, while that um, is underway. Sure. Okay, so I'm going to end the poll and share the results with you all. And uh, where are people located? Uh, very heavily in the Northeast at 73%. And um, we have five people in other, so they must be maybe in uh, Canada or outside the US. Um, and quite a spread actually of thinking of people who are um, beekeepers. We have uh, a bit over 60% who are beekeepers and 34% of people are thinking of becoming beekeepers. So um, that's a, a, a sizable number there. And, um, and uh, I, do you already practice IPM in your beekeeping? No, but I'm here so I can, uh, so I can start is 63%. So, so it sounds like a wonderful audience for Robin and probably exactly the kind of people she'd love to speak with. So with that, we'll move forward. Okay, so I'm ready to go. Yes, you're ready to go. <laughs> okay, thanks everyone for joining me. Um, it's great to have you here, especially people who are thinking about starting beekeeping or those that don't do IPM and want to get into it. Um, I am very happy to hear that. Um, so I think you probably know what IPM is. Um, it stands for Integrated Pest Management. And really what I love about it is that it makes your beekeeping more sustainable and it's based on science, which of course I'm a scientist, very passionate about, and it's data driven. Um, so we use information that we can gather to make decisions based on what's happening uh, in real time. Also, you need to really get to know your pest. So if you're gonna manage a pest, you need to know everything about it. Um, I love deep learning about everything I possibly can. Um, I'm gonna show you today how to monitor our pest population, which today is the varroa mites. 
And of course, we want what's best for our bees. Um, so we try to avoid harm by not letting mite populations get too high. We want to reduce pesticide use because you know we don't always want to be throwing chemicals in there. And of course, our overall goal is just plain maintaining the health of the colonies. We do this in part by um, first trying to avoid pesticide use, but then when we do use pesticides, we don't continuously use the same one over and over, but we rotate through several. And so we'll talk about that today. So this nice diagram uh, was made by Nick Slough, who um, you know, helps us in the entomology department, or he did until he found a different position. Um, but basically, this is showing you the IPM pyramid for Varroa mites. And this is part of a fact sheet that's published on the Penn State Extension website that is entitled Methods to Control Varroa Mites and Integrated Pest Management Approach. So everything that I talk about today can be seen in that free online resource, which is a downloadable PDF um, that you can use for um, remembering these things. So what you should notice on here is this pyramid has at its base cultural controls. Remember that they are aimed at reducing the reproduction of our pest. Then as you move up on the pyramid, you have actually killing the pest um, without chemicals. And then we move to the top, which is using chemicals to do that control. And really at the bottom, we have sort of prevention of a problem. And then we move up toward intervention. And so at the base of the pyramid, you can see here cultural controls. We're going to reprodu reduce reproduction. Very specifically, the number one thing to do is to use resistant stock. So also, when you're doing IPM, you need to pay attention to what you're doing, have records of what you've done in the past, what the mite levels have been over time. So I'm very, um, you know, being a data-driven person and using IPM, you'll need to also collect data. So you need a method of record keeping. So in order to do that, number one, every hive has to have a unique identifier. Um, you can name them after, you know, your favorite actresses, um, or what I do simply is give them a number. And that number is placed on the hive with some sort of permanent tag. My favorite tags are cattle ear tags that are these little flexible things that you can buy pre-numbered and uh, nail to the hive. Or lately I've been purchasing <clears throat> metal tags that are actually meant to be hammered onto trees, like for an arboretum where you're keeping track of the trees. What I like about them is they're, they're quite inexpensive. They come as a numbered series um, and just one little nail and it stays on your hive. <clears throat> So then you're going to use those numbers while you collect your data. So I like to use paper and a pen, um, mostly because even though there's really cool apps out there that are really great, um, I have sticky hands, propolis all over them, and I don't want to get that on my phone or my iPad. Plus, um, with paper, I can write it down and have that physical document, but also believe before I leave the apiary, take a photo, and now I have my digital archive of the data as well, just in case you know it flies out the window or a mouse chews it in my truck or something like that. So let's talk about using this. Um, across the top here, of course, we have the location and the date. Um, if you have multiple apiaries, you'll need to write down the location. Um, then it's simply just a series of boxes where you're either going to put a, an X or a check mark or a number, or at the end, you can write comments about that hive. Notice here on the left, uh, my hive number is a series of two numbers, actually. The first is the hive itself. So, you know, the hive is the physical box that the bees are in. And for me, that serves as a location. So you can see here at the bottom, I say, I use this like a map. Top down on the sheet is left to right in my line of hives. So I have hive number 211, 212, 213, et cetera, in a row. And then the other number tells me more about the colony inside. So the queen and her, where she came from and things like that. 
So the hive number location won't change year to year, but maybe a colony will die over the winter and it'll be replaced. So then that second number will change. Um, I work with several people and I like to know who was in the hive last. So I put the initials of the assessor. So that's whoever was collecting the data that day. And then of course, in my normal routine, I'm looking for all the different stages of bees. So were there eggs present, larvae and capped brood? I don't really care how much of each, I'm just checking that they're all there. That's my assessment of the queen. If I spotted the queen, I like to know that. And my queens are marked um, because I wanna know if she's been replaced or not. Um, and so if she's spotted, I'm gonna write in there the color of the dot that I put on her back, whether I added it that day or it's from a previous day. So that, that line might say green or blue or pink or something like that. Then I'm concerned about the queen, whether she's being superseded or the colony is going to swarm. So if I see supersedure cells or queen cells, I'm going to mark that. And then that needs further information. So did I just leave that there or did I go ahead and do something about it? I need to write a comment about that. Um, then moving farther to the right, we have Varroa inwash. So I'm gonna show you today uh, about the importance of monitoring your mites over time. I suggest that you do an alcohol wash every single month. So there should be a number in there. And when you're doing that wash, you're washing 300 bees and you're gonna get a number of mites in your filter. I prefer to simply write that down um, rather than doing the math to look at percent infestation, which I'd much rather do in the comfort of my own home when I get back. So how many mites were in the wash, knowing there were 300 bees. Then the next column is temperament. Um, I don't like to have bees that are uh, unhappy to see me. And so I write down sort of a level of temperament. So really gentle, medium, or really nasty. And then I track that over time. And if they're nasty time after time, I'm definitely gonna do something about that and uh, get them a new queen. If it's just one time, probably they were having a bad day for some reason. And then there's the area for comments. So anything about um, you fed today, added a super, took honey, saw a disease, anything you want, you have like a line and a half to write whatever you want. So this is what I use in the field. I write on paper, take a picture before I leave. Then when I get home, I transfer that to a digital spreadsheet where I use Google Docs, um, partly because um, I can get Google Docs on my phone or I can print this out and bring it with me. And what I find really important is to be able to look at a date and see what I did the last time I was in there before I open it. So here you can say each date. Um, I recommend checking your bees every two weeks. So you can see these dates are approximately 14 days apart, April through October. And each time I'm looking for the queen and looking for those stages of brood. So if I saw her, I note her color. If I didn't see her, that's okay. You don't have to find her every time, um, but you should be looking for all stages of brood. So yes, here means I saw eggs, larvae, and pupae. If I didn't see all stages, then I need a comment. So basically what happened here is there were capped swarm cells. And so I decided because I could still find the queen to take her away as a split and let them requeen rather than losing the bees to the trees um, in the form of a swarm. So I, two weeks later, I wouldn't open it because it takes a month for them to get a new queen. So after one month, I then uh, did look in. I didn't see all stages because it was a little bit too soon, but I did see eggs and larvae. So that means the queen um, was created, fought for herself, made in, started laying eggs. In fact, I found her and I marked her with the blue dot and so on. So noting what's going on with the colonies is really important so you can track it over time, especially this column with Varroa and treatments. So you're gonna be doing an alcohol wash every month, approximately. And so you're gonna be tracking the population over time. So you can see my numbers were pretty low. Um, early in the spring, a four um, in a wash means over 1%. So I went ahead and took advantage of the brood break that occurred because of that swarming tendency. And I treated with oxalic acid. I wrote down the dose and I wrote about doing it that day and repeating two times. Then the mite levels were low, just fine until the end of August when they got too high again. 
And that time I treated with formic acid and the form of formic pro two pads. So these are parts of IPM tracking, monitoring, writing down what you've used. And notice I've rotated chemicals here in this colony. I did oxalic acid early and formic acid late. So data recording is very important. So I didn't really like the way that things went for that colony. I don't really want to have to treat, especially not in the spring. So I'd like to requeen that one using this cultural control of resistance stock. So what do I have to choose from um, in that case? Well, there are multiple ways that mites can be controlled by the bees themselves. And these are um, genetic traits that cause a phenotype of an action. So one of these things that you can buy is honeybee stock that has this grooming behavior that we call mite biting. So you measure this pretty easily by looking at mites dropping onto the bottom board and looking for damage. So when you look under the microscope at these mites, you can see the one top left is perfect. All of the eight legs are uh, you know, undamaged, the body is not damaged, et cetera. And then as you look around, you can see arrows pointing to a missing leg or the body being bitten or something like that. So if you see um, over 35% of the mites that fell are damaged, they are considered to be mite biters. And this would be a great stock to add to your collection of different queens. Um, another thing that you could look for when you're asking around for a new queen is do, do they have hygienic behavior? Hygienic behavior is um, a way of the bees removing um, dead uh, pupae. So what you're seeing here is two different frames of brood that had a beautiful brood pattern, like a nice, a sheet of capped brood. And then the scientists went in, or the beekeeper, and did what we call a freeze killed brood assay. So for that, you put a three inch tube over some capped brood. Um, you pour in liquid nitrogen and let it boil off. That effectively has killed all the bees, the developing bees under those cappings. Then you put the frame back in the hive for two days, and then you see how much of it they have removed. So here in the Lex left, really great hygienic colony. They removed nearly every single dead pupa. On the right, only about 63% of those were removed, not really hygienic. Um, so that would not be considered to be a mite resistant stock. Similar to that is something that's really new. It's called UBO or unhealthy brood odor. For this, it's, it's more fine tuned um, and it's not just dead bees. Um, it's sort of unhealthy bees. So in this case, rather than putting liquid nitrogen into that tube, instead you're putting this thing that you can purchase called UBO, and you spray it on the cappings very gently. And only two hours later, you go back and see what they're removing. So at the top, you have a very high UBO score. You can see those, those pupae have been uncapped. They will be removed very soon. Below that, a low UBO score. So these would not be resistant bees. So this is a, a really great brand new, just this season, this is available to beekeepers to use uh, doing UBO testing. And then lastly is um, a test for what we call VSH, viroasensitive hygiene. Um, these bees can recognize that mites are infesting the brood. And when they are, they go in, uncap it and remove everything. So this takes advantage of what we know about varroa mite reproduction. It happens under the cappings. We know about the timing of reproduction, when that foundress mite is going to lay her first egg, which is a male, and then further eggs, which are females, and when those further females will be uh, mature. So you have to go in and uncap cells of exactly the right age of pupae, see if there's a mite in there. And if she is in there and not reproducing, that's fantastic. Um, if she is in there and reproducing, then the score is going down. So basically you open a hundred cells and see if those bees are allowing mice to reproduce. So VSH lines of queens are, are also available. So we went through um, four different mite resistance traits. We did mite biting, hygienic behavior, UBO, and VSH. So, uh, I think we're going to pause now and see if you have any questions up to this point. 
Great, wonderful. That's very interesting. Um, we actually only have one question that's come in so far, um, but people may be typing as we speak. Um, it's from Gary Fish, and he said, it seems like thymol, formic acid, and oxalic acid are quite toxic and not really much less risky than the synth synthetic mitocides. Why do you show them as softer? And that was when you showed that uh, pyramid at yep. the beginning. Yeah, we're going to go over each of those today. Um, and I'm going to tell you about how soft chemicals are from a natural source. Um, so that's what makes them soft. Um, uh, synthetic chemicals are from a lab, totally lab made, human created. And that's what makes them synthetic or hard. Um, it also has something to do with um, whether they're going to contaminate your products, um, either that being honey or wax. Um, synthetics are pretty bad about getting into the wax and staying there. And so the softer chemicals are not going to be um, persistent like that. Um, and then we have a question from Maria Rojas. Um, why are non-hygienic bee packages the only ones that are available? <laughs> That is a great question. Um, really, it's about supply and demand. Um, the package bee industry, I do feel like it's changing, um, but a lot of it we call unselected stock. So what they're really inter interested in is honey production and um, high volumes in spring so that they can make those packages. And many of them are not um, trying to make mite resistant bees. Um, so hopefully the future will change that. But um, one thing that I do suggest to people is if you want to have you know, a mite resistant line, you could buy a package from the South, set them up in your colony, get them building comb if it's brand new, and then requeen. And then from there, hopefully they'll survive and you can continuously have you know, better genetics. But those packages are highly valuable for those three pounds of workers that can really work for you early on. And they're available super early, like it's only a couple of weeks from now that they'll be coming up to the north. Great, thank you. Um, we have a lot of questions, so we're not going to go through them all in this at this session, but uh, there may be, we'll come back to them at the end too. Benjamin Hassan has asked, if there are many options for Varroa, why are so many beehives vulnerable? Yeah, again, it goes back to those packaged bees that are coming. Um, here in Pennsylvania, um, 10 or 20 or 30,000 honeybee packages come here every year. Um, so breeding programs are really difficult because, you know, with the open mating system of honeybees, uh, they just keep getting diluted with males from unselected stock. So it's a challenge, but um, hoping we can face it in the future with more closed mating systems and more saturation with really good genes. And we'll have one more question now, because I think some of the questions that are up, uh, you may respond to in your in the next part of the presentation. But Deborah Tela, Telatovich said, does better nutrition, i.e. hive alive, help bees ward off viruses better? I noticed that my bees love algae in the spring. Nutrition is absolutely critical to the bees. Um, it does help them, you know, having strong, healthy colonies with lots of great nutrition is great. Um, I don't know that it would help or change anything about the varroa mite population if you're using unselected stock. Um, so uh, yeah, I, and I, I, I don't want to say anything about any specific additives or, or anything like that, but good nutritious, especially in your landscape, is, is definitely a positive. Okay, great. All right, well, I'll suggest that we'll move on. And there's a couple of other great questions that um, we'll come back to if they're not addressed um, in the presentation. Okay, great. Okay, so uh, it's critical that you monitor your bees for mites and the there are other ways of monitoring that I think are a little bit less effective. So I recommend doing an alcohol wash. So an alcohol wash is basically, um, you're gonna collect from your colony uh, one half cup of bees not the queen and they should be workers and you're going to scoop them into a jar with alcohol and that alcohol should be about 70 percent concentration it can be ethanol uh, everclear or isopropyl alcohol 
And then you're gonna shake them up in there in the jar and pour the liquid through a sieve and collect the mites. So it's well known that a half a cup of bees is about 300 individuals. And then when you do the math with how many mites you find, then you get sort of a percent infestation or the number of mites per 100 bees. And so most of the recommendations are based on um, watching if it gets over one or 2%. I would recommend wherever you're living, ask the beekeepers around you, what is your treatment threshold? Um, maybe 1%, 2% or 3%. So in a wash of 300 bees, 2% would be six mites. So if you see seven mites, then you should do something about it. Um, but it's really critical to, to do this um, regularly and follow the progression of the population. Uh, here you can see there is, um, I have a fact sheet about, um, you know, using household products or things you can buy like locally to do your alcohol washes, or there are commercial products available. This one here is called the Varroa Easy Check. Um, for that one, you count the mites kind of in the bottom of the liquid, whereas for mine, you pour it through a filter. And you can see all the mites here in this filter. I don't even need to count. I know that this colony is in trouble. Um, so if you want to see those details, they're step-by-step -step online at the Extension website. Just go to extension.psdu.edu and you can type, you know, alcohol wash and the instructions will come up for you. So you can try my method there for that. Okay, so I was talking about those treatment thresholds and I just want to give a shout out to the Honeybee Health Coalition who has a really great varroa mite management um, document. And in there, what I my favorite thing is thinking about how your threshold can change over time um, based on what's happening um, in the environment and what's happening in the colony. So notice here that um, there's different colony phases. So dormant with brood, so that's kind of right now. Um, they, they're just coming out of winter and they're starting to gear up to make brood. They could be dormant without brood. They could be in spring where the population is increasing, summer where it's at its peak, or it could be decreasing like in fall. So it's important to understand that the mites want to be in the brood, they wanna be in the capped cells reproducing. So when you do that alcohol wash, you're not really capturing the 80% of mites that are inside of the cells. You're just looking at what's on the adults. And that's okay because that's what these numbers are based on, having those situations. Um, but you'll notice that, um, you know, it's lower acceptable numbers are earlier in the season and then it gets a little bit higher later in the season because later in the season we really expect the mite loads to have increased um, and it's not quite as harmful. If you have a high mite load early, that means you're really, really gonna have a high one late if you don't do anything about it. But if it's higher later, um, sure you have to do something about it before winter, but it wasn't critical um, earlier on. So if you see numbers over two to or three percent, as I was saying, that's when you're in the danger zone. That's when you really should be applying a chemical treatment. Um, hopefully you're going to be doing cultural mechanical controls and those levels will not get to this. That's kind of the goal of our IPM program. Um, I just want to say generally that animal welfare must be considered. You know, honeybees are living organisms and not monitoring or controlling mites at all is not an acceptable route. Um, if mite levels get high, you most certainly have very high levels of viruses in your bees. They could suffer from what we call parasitic mite syndrome, which is really devastating to see, where you see sunken larvae and the colonies collapsing and bees have deformed wings from that virus. It will lead to colony death probably by November of that year. And all the while, when you're not controlling the mites not controlling the viruses, those viruses can spill over into the wild bee population around. So you need to be um, a good steward and monitor and control varroa mites. So I'm glad you're here to learn about how to do that. Okay, so at the bottom of the pyramid, again, we had cultural controls. We already talked about using resistant stock. So now I'll go over the other two cultural controls, small cell comb and a brood break. Um, when you're starting off your colony, you have many choices to make about the frames and the foundation that you're gonna put in there. And um, one of your choices could be um, foundationless. 
And to do that, the, you just give them the frame and a little starter, and then they build comb of whatever size they choose. That's fine. It's a little bit more difficult to manage. Sometimes the bees go in the wrong direction and it becomes a little mess, but it can be done. I've done it. Um, you could give them standard comb, which is either plastic or wax, um, with imprints of hexagons of a size of about 5.2 to 5.4 millimeters. That's our standard worker comb. Or you could choose very specifically to use what we call small cell comb. And for that, those imprinted hexagons are 4.9 millimeters. So in this example, we're measuring the size of the comb. And really, you cannot measure individual cells. I've really tried it. My eyes like go buggy and it's very inaccurate. So what we suggest instead is to measure 10 cells in a line. So you can see here cell number one's outer wall uh, in red. And then over here to the right, we have the outer wall of cell number 10. And this is about uh, 49 millimeters. And then when you divide by 10, 4.9 millimeter cell size. So if you looked up the scientific literature about the effectiveness of small cell comb in controlling mites, you're gonna see lots of papers that says it does, lots of papers that says it doesn't. So it's not a sure thing, um, but in my mind, it doesn't hurt anything. Uh, there's nothing that happens bad to the bees. So just for the possibility of maybe it helping, um, you can go for small cell comb if you wish. Um, it ends up being more expensive because it's not very popular and your choices are more limited in the what those are made of. But if you really want to do it, go for it. Um, another thing to do is you could do what we call a brood break. So because of what we know about our pest um, infesting capped brood, we can have a period where there isn't any capped brood. And so by removing the ability for the bees to reproduce, you're also removing the ability for the mites to reproduce. So one way of doing this is to cage the queen for two to three weeks. Um, there's different types of cages, some let her lay eggs and some don't, um, but basically you're pausing the reproduction of the bees um, in most of the colony, like 90% of the you know, comb cannot be brewed because the queen's not available to lay those eggs. So all the mites then come out onto the adult bees. And so that period of their life is called the phoretic phase. And at that time, you can then couple this with a chemical treatment. So most of the treatments, um, four out of five of the treatments that I'm gonna discuss today, cannot get into the cappings and kill the mites there. So the might the mites have to be on adult bees. So during a brood break would be a time when they're uh, vulnerable. You have to consider when you might do this um, in the season. Uh, you don't wanna do it too early on, like during the honey production phase, because um, you want your bees to build up and make you lots of honey. Um, so you don't wanna cut down on honey production. Also, you don't wanna do it super late um, because the winter bees need to be made and the larger winter populations are the ones that are gonna survive throughout that, that season. Um, so I would recommend doing it in during the dearth. So the dearth is a time when there's not a lot of nectar sources available. Um, here in Pennsylvania, that would be mid-July to mid-August um, where sort of the main honey flow has ended and they're sort of just maintaining status quo. So it's not a really big deal to pause some brood making at that time. Um, one of these cages that I mentioned is called a Scalvini cage. And the queen would get trapped in this little box and there's comb at the back and she's able to lay eggs, but that brood can never um, be capped because the cage is too shallow. And so it keeps the queen laying, keeps them happy, keeps her pheromones going. Um, but it doesn't allow any brood. So it becomes a true brood break. Um, so try that sometime. Another way to have a brood break is to actually split the colony. So you can take a nuke out of the colony. So you would take the queen, some food, some brood and all the bees adhering to that. You can go ahead and make that a new colony. And then what's left behind has to go ahead and make their own queen. And so you've left behind eggs and young larvae um, maybe there's queen cells because they were thinking about swarming already, but regardless, they have to make a new queen and that takes time. 
So a queen develops from egg to adult in about 16 days. It'll be less because they won't start at the egg stage. They'll start at the young larva stage. So 10 to 12 days and you'll have a new virgin queen. Then she takes about 10 days to go off and mate to come back and mature and start laying. So you're gonna have a good 20 day break in brood just by removing the queen and causing them to make another one. Okay, so if we move up onto the pyramid um, where we get to our mechanical controls, uh, the first one here, and I think this is a highly valuable strategy, is to do what we call mite trapping. So again, knowing our pest very well, um, what you can see here is worker development. So they're an egg for three days. So each cell represents a day. Then they're a larva and then they get capped over. This is when the mite's gonna enter the cell right before capping. And then she's gonna reproduce in here. So once she um, gets into the cell and the bee, um, you know, she's gonna start feeding. She'll lay an egg that becomes a male first. And then every 20 hours, she'll lay another egg that becomes a female. So in this process, um, workers take only 21 days from egg to emergence. And so on average, the number of daughters that can be made, and that's all she needs to do is make daughters, um, is 1.2. So almost always, she only makes one offspring in a worker cell. In drones, on the other hand, um, you can see how much longer they take to mature. So they take 24 days. So if a worker emerges at 21 days with on average one mite per attempt, you can imagine that there's one, two, or three more daughters that can emerge from a drone cell. So the if you give varroa mites a choice, they're absolutely going to choose drone brood, and that's because they can make more offspring. And we can take advantage of that by encouraging the mites to go into drone brood, and then we remove that drone brood. So these green frames are available for purchase. They have very large cell size because that's what they need for drones. And so the queen, they'll draw that out. The queen will lay her unfertilized eggs in there. They will become drones. It's just a magnet for varroa mites. And then once it's capped over, those mites are trapped in there. So you have some choices. You can either remove that frame and freeze it for two days and bring it back. And then everybody's dead in there and then the bees will remove it and reuse it or you can scrape it off. This is what I've had to do because my apiaries are far away from my freezer. So I would just scrape it off and give it back and all the mites uh, went in the bucket. Um, one danger with this is if you're not a very organized person and you're not visiting your colonies regularly, if you let it go for 24 days, you're actually growing your mite population. So this takes some strategic planning and making sure that you get back um, in a timely manner within 14 to 23 days to take care of that drone brood. If you don't wanna use those green frames, you can sort of do DIY, and that is either just put a short frame in and then they'll grow drone brood under it, or do something strange like this where you have, um, you know, just a space for them to build in. You can see that this is drone brood, cut it out, put it in your bucket, and they'll rebuild it. So just like scraping off the frames uh, in the other picture. Again, notice that this is spray painted to make sure you recognize that that frame is what it is and you need to pay attention to it. Um, another way to remove mites from the hive is to use what we call a screen bottom board. So you could buy a solid bottom board where this is just wood, or you can buy one like this that has a screen underneath. And so what happens is um, mites naturally just fall off of bees, you know, here and there, they just lose their grip or whatever. Um, and so they fall down through the screen. And if this insert is removed, the mites are gonna fall out and just fall right onto the ground below. And it's gonna be too far for them to crawl back up and return to the hive. Um, research has shown that this can reduce the mite population by 14, 28, or 37%, depending on the project that was done. And this is absolutely helpful. Um, that's gonna be removing mites constantly from your hive. However, generally the mites um, still build up to those damaging levels. So you can't just give them a screen bottom board and trust that that's all you need. Um, it's helpful, but not good enough by itself. Remember, you're gonna have all these preventions and you know killing of mites and whatever you might want to do, um, but you still must monitor. And if you get mites that 
are in an alcohol wash above the threshold of let's just call it 2%, that is when it's time to act with a chemical treatment. So personally, I um, only use soft chemicals. Uh, I have used the hard chemicals in the past, but I have found through research that you can sufficiently control varroa mites using soft chemicals. And we have three of them that are actually approved for organic management. Um, so you can still rotate and use only soft chemicals that are all organic approved. So those would be oxalic acid, formic acid, and thymol. So for me, um, the way I rotate my chemicals using my IPM approach is, of course, when I monitor and get mites above the threshold early on, so April and May, that's when I will use an oxalic acid treatment. So you can see that here. Um, there's two ways of applying it. One is as a dribble where it's mixed with sugar syrup and um, dribbled onto the bees. This only kills mites on adult bees, so you need to repeat it. And so you're going to be going in and giving this treatment uh, three times at a five to seven day interval. So that effectively makes it a long term treatment where you're treating the mites as they come out of the cells. So you can do the dribble, which is mixed with sugar water or the other um, product. The other way that you can do it is with a vapor. And so that requires specialized equipment where you burn it and um, sublimate the crystals into the air in the hive. Uh, again, repeated treatments. Um, of course, I work for Penn State Extension. I'm not going to tell you about any off-label uh, treatments, but oxalic acid, the only uh, approved uh, product is called ABBoxol in this container that you can see here to the right. Yes, you can buy it as wood bleach at Home Depot, but it is not the approved chemical for use um, in hives to control varroa mites. So moving on in the season then, um, in June and July, my preferred treatment, my preferred soft chemical is formic acid. Formic acid is legally sold as two different products. One is called MitoAway Quick Strips, that's your Max, or Formic Pro. And both of these are a gel formulation of formic acid wrapped in paper. They come in these gel packs. Um, and you place them on the top bars of the bottom brood chamber, just like you can see here. Um, and you close it up and um, it vaporizes in there over the next two weeks. Uh, one thing about formic acid that I absolutely love is that it is the treatment that is able to kill mites even under the cappings. So this really is a great blast. It's killing mites on adult bees, it's killing mites in the brood. Um, so that is fantastic. Apply it once, leave for two weeks and forget it. Um, those gel pads are compostable. When you get back, they'll be safe to touch. You can just chuck them into the woods or take them home and put them in the trash if you want. Um, but I think it's a great product. The problem with formic acid is that it is highly temperature dependent. Um, if it's too cold, it won't work. And if it's too hot, you're risking your queen and your brood. Um, so you have to very carefully read the label and consider the forecasted temperatures, especially for the first three days that those pads are in there. Um, it cannot be over 85 degrees. And really, if it wasn't over 80, that'd be even better if you can find a window in June and July for that. Um, by the way, for both oxalic acid and formic acid, these can be used with the honey supers on. Um, which really goes to show how natural these chemicals are that they're not a concern. Um, for contaminating your honey or any of your products. Then we move on in the season toward the fall. And um, in the fall, I, I still really like formic acid the best. So I'm gonna monitor what I've treated my colonies with throughout the season. And if I haven't used formic acid or I've only used it one time, I will definitely use it again in the fall. This is my favorite treatment. It's very quick, killing the mites under the cappings, all natural, et cetera. Um, but if I've already used it once or twice, I really don't want to use it a third time. So my next go-to then would be the picture in the middle, and this is a thymol treatment. Um, the registered product is called Apigard. It comes either pre-measured in a sachet, like you can see here, where you just pull the top off and stick it on the top bars, 
or you can get a whole bucket of this stuff and then you have to measure it out onto like a little paper card. Um, you cannot have your honey on at the time of treatment with Tymol um, because it's very stinky stuff. Um, it's it's a it's a it's like a natural smell, a woodsy smell, but you really don't want that flavor in your honey. Um, and it's most effective um, without those supers on anyway because of the size of the hive itself. So you just put a little spacer so the bees can move around this stuff, add it one day, come back two weeks later, add a second set and leave for four weeks. So really it's a six week treatment, again, treating mites only on adults. On the right, we then have our synthetic or our hard chemical, which is Apivar. Um, the active ingredient is Amitraz. This is, comes in these little plastic strips, which I personally, I use a little nail to hang it between the frames. You use uh, four strips in a full-size hive. You cannot have your honey supers on because you'll be contaminate your honey with Amitraz and you put it in and you just leave for six whole weeks and then you remove it. Um, so these are my fall treatments. Um, again, paying attention, you don't wanna use Apivar, 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 or Formic, Formic, Formic. You wanna continuously be switching it up um, to avoid resistance. There is a lot of documented resistance to the Apivar product um, because of its overuse. So we definitely wanna avoid that. There is no documented resistance uh, anywhere in the world to oxalic acid, formic acid, or thymol that has been reported. So now we come to winter. Um, my go-to for success is to downsize my hives to their winter size, which for me, you can see in this picture is three medium boxes. I actually don't use deep boxes, I use medium. So three medium boxes. Um, I treat for Varroa um, at the same time, mid-August. Um, I then let them feed themselves throughout September and by October I weigh it and feed them if I have to. I'd much rather have them feed themselves and get natural food than feed them sugar syrup, but I absolutely will if I need to. My goal is 60 pounds of excess weight for the winter. Um, so just to review, um, so, sorry, to, to complete the year. so. Over the winter and into the early spring, I visit my colonies every month. Just, it kind of grounds me to see who's alive and who's not, check for food, make sure they have enough. They should, if I gave them 60 pounds, usually I don't have to feed them, any of them until maybe February. Uh, I do go in and give an oxalic acid vapor like between Christmas and New Year's as a, sort of a cleanup because I know at that time there isn't any brood present. So it's like, a, Whatever I didn't control in the fall, let's just get rid of any that are left and then they'll go into spring with great numbers and I have really good success with this. Um, over the winter, um, unlike all the rest of the year where you can feed liquid food, which is in the form of sugar syrup, in the winter you can only feed solid food. So that has to be literally like, you know, sugar crystals like you would put in your coffee or fondant or um, sugar cakes that we can make. Um, or winter patties, some sort of solid. They can't handle the liquid because it requires too much processing, too much moving. And if you put a whole bunch of it in, it's just gonna be like this cold mass that will affect their uh, ability to heat themselves. Um, in terms of feeding them pollen, pollen patties or protein, I generally don't. If I did, I would be giving them just a little bit in March, um, but generally I don't. Okay, so you're, process as a beekeeper should be to understand that you are, you know, responsible for them and their well-being. The best thing you can do is monitor for mites every single month and act when they get over the threshold. Use an alcohol wash. It is the most reliable and definitely keep close records because you want to make sure that you're monitoring the mite uh, growth over time. Also, what chemicals you've used and how much. And by the way, those the data becomes in really handy when you get all those calls to do surveys um, and they ask you all those questions, you'll have that in front of you. So please keep notes and name your colonies. Okay, so I would encourage everyone to insist on resistance stock. Every time you wanna buy a queen, you ask them what resistance uh, type do you have? And maybe the queen producers will begin to um, take that to heart and try harder to have mite resistance. 
Um, you can also test your colonies yourself if you have a lot of them. You may have these traits already in your population and you could choose to propagate more from the ones that have it and less from the ones that do not. Um, even if you do have mite resistant stock, um, perhaps you should continue to monitor mites anyway. Um, the stock doesn't, if, if you're not continuously infusing that trait into the population and then they're swarming and requeening and open mating in your area, it may be getting diluted with those package drones. Uh, maybe after today, you'll consider adopting some cultural and or mechanical controls that you hadn't tried before, and maybe that'll help you to have to treat less often. But you need to monitor and treat with chemicals if they get over the threshold. It's really critical for their welfare and for the sustainability of your apiary. Um, I just want to promote a few of our um, Penn State Extension products. Again, um, you can find for free online this Methods to Control Varroa Mites, uh, this IPM approach, free. Um, we do have a Beekeeping 101 class if you're interested in learning that in an online format. Um, we also have a guide to lots of honeybee problems that may be beneficial um, if you're not very good at recognizing other diseases, American fowl brood, European fowl brood, on and on, all those things that we all need to understand. So that's available also on the Extension website. So thank you, and I would be happy to take questions. We have lots of questions, probably more than we have time to answer. I do want to note that it is uh, 11.57, so we will answer maybe uh, 10 minutes of questions if, um, if Robin or possibly 15 we'll see how, we'll see what it feels like and um i don't think we'll answer them all but um um so actually this might be a quick question um you mentioned um doing the washes monthly and someone said when should you start the wash process what month in the northeast so does that mean you do it monthly year round regardless uh it is monthly only during the bee season so you could start in april and you'll finish in october okay great thank you um all right <laughs> um and uh and this is kind of a big question but i'm, I'm sure other people have it does qu uh, climate change and growing degree days coming earlier in the season affect how often you treat and do testing um it really doesn't if you monitor monthly and react each time they're above the threshold um that's pretty standard Perhaps it's requiring us to test in March or maybe through November. Mm -hmm. um, but so far, so good with having mites low. So treating an up, the critical thing is for winter bees to be made without mite pressure. So controlling the mites by the end of August, then double checking in the fall to make sure that treatment worked and that the mites are still low. Treat again if you have to. Um, but it's all about vigilance. So I think that if you are vigilant, you'll be okay. Okay, great. Um, and Cheryl Tupper said, I was taught to use nurse bees for an alcohol wash. Randy Oliver said he uses bees one frame away from the brood frames. Which bees should we wash? That is the eternal question. Um, what I do is I find a frame of bees with older open brood. So I guess I'm telling you nurses is correct. Um, there is new work out showing that um, drones are really the ones that have the mites on them. But keep in mind that all of these thresholds are based on doing that wash of nurses, of workers. So these values are still legitimate for knowing when to treat. Um, Lani uh, Rosenlev said, how does a mite know that it's a drone cell versus a worker cell? Uh, yeah, there are different pheromones coming from these different cells. Um, so they know they that it's very important for them to know. Um, mm -hmm. In fact, Varroa mites evolved on uh, the Asian hive bee where the those bees um, are so vigilant that the mites can only reproduce in drone cells. So it was kind of only recently that when they got hopped onto Apis mellifera and spread around the world that they were are able to go back to workers, actually. Oh, interesting. Yeah. All right. And then uh, Garrett Livermore um, 
uh, had a question. When I buy locally bred mite resistant bees, the breeders don't specify what type of hygienic behavior they're selling. How important is it to identify the specific behavior? Um, kind of up to you. Uh, you could ask them more questions, ask them how they know that. It is possible to do breeding simply by watching those alcohol washes and making sure they never get over threshold. Um, that's sort of like the simplest breeding program where you're not looking for why, you just see the results. The results of it. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so Scott Hoffman said on testing for mites, if you have a hundred hives, do you need to test each hive or a percentage of your total apiary? Um, I think it's okay to do a percentage of your apiary. Uh, like you might have 12 colonies in one location. Maybe you're going to test three or four of them. But if the first one you test has high mites, you might as well just test, treat the whole apiary. So yes, you're right. I would say 25% at least. Okay, great. I should just note, um, we have high winds here. I just had a big branch tree fall down. Um, if I disappear, I will come back. I'll switch to uh, I'll switch to my cell phone for for <laughs> connection. <laughs> just had a big crash in my in my yard. Um, okay. Uh, uh, Cheryl Tapper said, uh, "One of the concerns with letting bees cam cannibalize scraped drone brood caps will the mites just re-enter the cells?" And our diseases spread with that technique as well. Um, so I'm trying to understand. So you're thinking of the, when I scrape the drone brood off and give it back to the colony, um, the mites have been removed. So there's no chance that those mites can re-enter. Um, the, the virus issue is a maybe. Um, Hopefully by keeping mites low, you're keeping virus levels low. So it's not a really big concern. Um, but if you're talking about after we freeze them and then the bees have to go ahead and take the cappings off and remove those pupae, um, I think for the most part, they're just removing them and throwing them on the ground. They're not gonna really eat them, mm -hmm. but they might. Your chickens will love it actually, if you wanna just feed it to them instead. <laughs> All right, great. Um, okay. Um, uh, um, I'm just skirting through here. Um, oh, yes. Yeah. So, uh, Jane Port said, I've only heard of the oxalic acid dribble, uh, during the winter when the bees are clustered. Is it used at other times as well? Yes, it is. Um, you can use it m most any time of the year. Um, but remember that it only treats the mites that are on adult bees. So you have to do repeated treatments for it to really work. So to me, one treatment is like going there three or four times uh, in a row and putting the product on. Okay. Um, and then Marie Rojas, um, she said, oxalic acid is my pet peeve. There are a lot of beekeepers in my area that use it off label and just keep using it over and over again. I've been told that they won't develop resistance, but I'm not so sure. Can you speak to this? By the way, I'm an IPM consultant for the green industry, so I get annoyed when uh, beekeepers uh, don't rotate chemicals. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I can't say I'm an expert in resistance development or physiology or anything like that, but it does seem to me that having a chemical there all the time is not a positive, right? But I've been told that the, the mechanism behind that active ingredient is such that it's unlikely to, to develop resistance. Um, so I know, the, I know what you're talking about with having oxalic acid on all the time. There's an off-label use where you just have it there in low levels. And it, it's not a treatment for mites, but it keeps the population low. Um, it's in the hands of the EPA right now. So I guess they're going to be able to decide whether that becomes a labeled product or not. And I hope that they're considering uh, resistance development in their decision. Mm -hmm. um, so there are scientists that understand this better than I do. Okay. Um, are there any feasible biological control agents for Varroa? Uh, no one has found any biological controls. However, I have just learned about some new technology that's called RNAi, RNA 
interference that is, I believe, fed to the bees. And then when the mites feed on them, it kills the mites. That is looking to be very promising. Um, so keep your eyes open for that. Okay. Um, someone asked, is it easy to see if a mite is missing a leg? Do you need a microscope for that? You need a microscope and no, it's not easy even with a microscope. <laughs> okay. I was thinking the same thing. So thank you for asking that. I mean, cause they're um, curled and then you're like, I don't know, is there a foot there or not? Yeah. Okay. Um, how soon after installing a new package would you suggest doing an alcohol wash for Varroa? Um, that's a very safe period where mites can't really build up very quickly. So I would probably preserve those 300 bees um, and only do your wash like a, two months later, I think. All right, great. It'd be pretty safe, yeah. Okay. And uh, Lawrence uh, Simino said, should a, bee uh, should a beekeeper avoid introducing a swarm to their apiary and just rely on their own splits? Uh, that That's a loaded question. Um, if I collected a swarm, I would think that isolating it somewhere is a good idea. So having like a quarantine apiary to assess that colony. Um, you really have no idea where it came from. So it could have come from an awesome genetic source, right? Like some bees that survived in a tree in the forest without a beekeeper, and they may be super mite resistant. Or they could just be, so, you know, your beekeeper neighbor with unselected stock from whatever. So um, I would isolate it, make sure it doesn't develop, you know, the worst disease that's American foul brood, test it for mites, and maybe do some of those tests for um, mite resistance and make your decision after that with more data, because I like data. Um, yeah, sorry, that's complicated. <laughs> <laughs> um, and we have other questions, but um, Benjamin Hassan has asked uh, two, and I'm going to ask them, and these may, may be out of your wheelhouse, but we'll, I'll ask them anyway. So um, one is, what support can government agencies like EPA and USDA to support Varroa countermeasures? And he also asked, is it realistic that Varroa could one day be eliminated or at least minimized nationwide? I actually love those questions. Um... So for me, when I think about chemical controls, I get really frustrated because if it's a very cheap, readily available product, no one wants to spend the money and time to go through the registration and make it a labeled product, right? So I would love for the government agencies to have like uh, an easy path for the registration of like pesticides that aren't likely to cause any harm right? Like natural products, for example, like you read about all these essential oils and I don't know, garlic powder and all these strange things that beekeepers say work, but who's going to spend money registering something that I can buy at Walmart for five bucks and treat 20 colonies, right? Because you're never going to get your investment back. So the fact that money rules the world is a major frustration. And I wish they would try to eliminate that in cases like this. Um, and I do really, really think that the future of beekeeping and mite control is in breeding. I really think that we can, if we can get everybody to have bees with these resistant traits, especially varroa sensitive hygiene and that UBO that's new, if, if we can continuously increase the proportion of the population that can control mites all by themselves, I think that's, that can change the world. I really do. Okay, great. Okay. Um, and uh, okay, there's uh, there's more questions that we can answer. So I'm trying to scroll through. And then I'm what I'm thinking actually is maybe the ones that we didn't answer live. Um, Robin could look at later. And if there's someone that she really wants to write an answer to, we can put that with the with the recording. Um, but uh, Matt Sieber has said, is the oxalic dribble done directly into the brood box only or in the honey supers as well and regarding formic acid what is the low temperature cutoff well i'm sure you can look that up so uh -huh. yeah um so you're going to be treating the bees that are nurse bees and um with the dribble uh the dose you know you read the package you put 35 grams of crystals into a liter of syrup 
but your one colony is only going to get a maximum of 50 milliliters. So you're going to fill up a syringe with 50 and you're going to put five, five, five in between each frame until you get to 50. And so if you have 10 frame equipment and it's full of bees, it's just on the top of one box and then you close it up and then everything spreads naturally. Um, and yes, the low temperature will be on the formic acid product label. Okay. And, uh, there's also a comment here that AP boxal oxalic acid isn't the only one uh, that's legal anymore. Mike's Bees ha has EPA registration around 40 state approvals. So if uh, folks maybe not have known that. so Oh, I'd love if you would email me that name. That would help me out. Great. Okay. It'll be in the, it'll be in the, we'll, we'll have the, uh, that. Okay. Um, and somebody says, um, I've heard that NOD, claim, NOD claims its formic products can penetrate through wax cappings, but um, is there really research yet to support that? There absolutely is. I've done some of it. Um, and I will tell you that using the two, so they give you different ways of using the pads. You can use two pads at once for two weeks, or you can do one pad and then one pad. I think the one in one isn't doing it, but the dose is high enough when you use two pads at once. It absolutely is killing mites under the capping. Yes. Right. And um, Matt Sieber said, how can one apply oxalic acid vapor without opening up the high during the very cold winter months? Yeah, you can either put the the tube right in the entrance or you can drill like a, a hole in the bottom board and the way that the wand is devised um it fits right in and you just poof it's all internal at that point so it's hard to you know without having the device to show you what i'm talking about but okay. it also you know it fits right in the entrance hole as well um, okay. and then i'll make this the last question um and i apologize to the people that still have ones open um how does A. serrana react to Varroa versus A. mal? <laughs> yeah, so that's the Asian hive bee, Apis serrana. Um, they're very well adept at keeping the mite populations low. And part of that is that they force them only to reproduce in the drone cells. Um, otherwise, I believe they uncap and remove from worker cells. Um, mm -hmm. Apis mellifera just hasn't had an, enough time with them. Um, you know, they only jumped over, uh, you know, 100 years ago, and that's nothing for yeah. evolution. Okay. All right. Actually, I'm going to change my, my there's one last question I'm going to ask in case you have anything nice to add to it. Um, somebody, uh, Camilla Perez said, what is another sign that a beehive isn't healthy? Because I know you went over that list in the beginning, and they asked if there was anything else that you, that would be a sign. Um, you know, if they're not growing, if they're not making honey, um, there's lots of different signs of different diseases that, you know, I could do a whole webinar on six of those diseases, what to look out for. Um, but a healthy colony is going to be robust and growing. All the brood and food is going to be pearly white. You never want to see it yellow or brown. Um, you know, the bees will look well, they'll be furry, their wings will be perfect. Um, yeah, recognize what's healthy. And uh, if you see unhealthy, something is off, call someone to come and have a look. Okay, great, wonderful. Okay, well, we are going to, um, we have a, a few last pieces before we end. Um, and I can actually share my screen, I believe. There we go, all right, okay. Um, so we are, uh, we have, uh, some last questions for you, um, and you should see a poll on your screen. I am going to close it up and share the results. You might find this, uh, interesting. Um, so 64% use, um, alcohol washes and, uh, you can see the others that are being used, uh, other, uh, monitoring methods that are used. Um, 51 percent of people use uh, by uh, by unselected stock and uh, 34 percent uh, by selected stock. Um, and uh, of all of these practices, the small cell comb um, is only used by 66 percent. So maybe that's uh, something that people are more interested in in trying um, after this webinar. Um, 
do you use one chemical ex uh, uh, miticide exclusively? And 64% of people rotate chemicals, which I'm sure will make our questioner happy. And 60%, um, and, uh, actually 86%, of people who watch this webinar are more likely to increase their use of IPM after this webinar. So I am sure that that is music to Robin's ears. And um, so I'm just going to go through a, a couple of little things before we end. We have two more webinars coming up. Um, one um, on uh, kosher halal and insects and how do they relate. And actually, these are all beekeepers on this webinar. So you may be interested in that. Um, and um, in April, we have one on uh, reducing synthetic chemical use to optimize pest management and crop production, a case study of onion thrips in onion. And they got some pretty amazing results from that study. So if you are uh, grow onions or you know someone that does, um, I think that that will be interesting. Um, if you would like to be in touch with other people who love bees, this is your chance to do it. Uh, you can put a, a profile about yourself on our website, um, and you can also find other people who have put uh, profiles about themselves on our website. So if you were interested, for example, in participating in a study or a survey uh, with Robin, this would be a place where you might put a profile. And when she's you know, looking for people, it might be a place where researchers would go um, so they can find sites to collaborate. And um, so it's called our Find a Colleague site. So I encourage you to use that. Our recording will be available in about a week and I will email that to you. So anyone who has registered will get a copy of the, um, of the webinar. Um, I do want to acknowledge that the Northeastern IPM Center is based at Cornell University in Ithaca, New York. Cornell University is located on the traditional homelands of the Gayokono, the Cayuga Nation. The Gayokono are members of the Haudenosaunee Confederation, an alliance of six sovereign nations with a historic and contemporary presence on this land. The Confederacy precedes the establishment of Cornell University, New York State, and the United States of America. We acknowledge the painful history of Gayokono dispossession and honor the ongoing connection of the Gayokono people, past and present, to these lands and waters. And this land acknowledgement has been reviewed and approved by the traditional Gayokono leadership. And uh, I also want to acknowledge that uh, this presentation would not be possible without you paying your taxes that go to the USDA, that uh, then comes in the form of a grant to us. And, um, and uh, I am sure um, um, we have uh, others. Uh, I was thinking there would be other uh, acknowledgements from Robin for her funders, but um, I'm sure it is the same, a lot of federal funding and uh, from other sources as well. So, but primarily thank you, Robin. Thank you for all those late nights studying and uh, all your dedication and love clearly for this, uh, for this topic. And, your helpfulness and uh, I just really appreciated how much you enjoyed answering the questions and and engaging with people on something that you love so thank you and uh, with that we will conclude the webinar so thank you for having me bye-bye